Uh, thanks a lot, Alison. You can start when you're ready. Thank you, Sam. Can you hear me clearly? <clears throat> yes, very well, Ellen. Good, fantastic. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Sam. My name is Alison. Um, so today I'm going to be discussing um, the um, approaches or at least the sites in which um, sacral neuromodulation is beneficial and helpful in the urology setting. Uh, and I will uh, go a little bit into the mechanism of action of sacral neuromodulation too. So this is just an introduction. So we'll start with a bit about the history of uh, electrical stimulation for medical purposes. <clears throat> um, and then we'll discuss, as I said, uh, the presumed mechanism of action, how sacral neuromodulation has its effect. And we'll discuss some of the applications. This is quite a big topic, so I'm just going to um, be talking in general on some topics. And there may be some uh, items that we can always go into more detail on if there are questions that someone would like me to raise. So electrical stimulation in medicine has a fairly long history. Um, you can have a read uh, on the screen of this um, uh, expert or this uh, quote that I've written from a uh, doctor or a um, carer of uh, many, many, many years ago, uh, who found that uh, standing on or being in contact with an electric ray of some fish uh, of some sorts uh, could bring about uh, a reduction in uh, pain or discomfort that patients were experiencing. So it would be many, many years later before um, electricity was developed. And with electricity then came uh, human use of uh, electrical stimulation for multiple purposes, including the development of the cardiac pacemaker. And then with time, uh, utilization was then changed or altered to other forms of medicine. So in terms of urology and sacral neuromodulation specifically, um, in the 1870s, a Danish surgeon uh, first introduced the idea of electrically stimulating the bladder. So at that time, you know, animal studies were easily done and uh, the bladder as a pacemaker or as a uh, stimulating uh, organ was, was uh, uh, then kind of looked at and whether one could stimulate the external urethral sphincter muscle or whether one was stimulating the detrusor muscle itself. Um, so those were the early studies of uh, the actual physical uh, stimulation of the muscle um, at the bladder level. And then it was only really in the uh, late 1980s that uh, the kind of founders of sacral neuromodulation started looking at neurophysiology of low urinary tra tract control. And the Tanaho and Smith uh, looked at um, uh, the patients with neuropathic voiding disorders. So sacral neuromodulation has its ground or its start in neuropathic bladder dysfunction, even though these days it is really more uh, focused, or at least the research is much more on non-neurological lower urinary tract dysfunction. And from this then came the development of uh, the most commonly used and first FDA approved uh, device for the use of sacral neuromodulation, which is the interstim device. Um, so, um, because um, Medtronic um, and the Interstim device have had the monopoly in this uh, field for, for many, many, many years, um, and my images and discussion will mostly be related to that. And we don't have um, studies, at least, uh, related to the newer devices or newer models. So they certainly are, are newer products on the market, but you'll see quite a bit of my literature is, is discussing uh, the interstim product specifically, and it's not um, um, specifically because I'm uh, trying to market that company specifically, just as a warning or as a, a statement from the start. So this interstim product was initially approved firstly for refractory urge urinary incontinence um, and subsequently 
what we would refer to as OAB dry, which is your urgency frequency syndrome, um, and then urinary retention, uh, so primarily non-neurogenic urinary retention, were then uh, added as uh, FDA-approved uh, conditions for use, and fecal incontinence uh, was also then FDA-approved in 2010. So what exactly is sacral neuromodulation? So uh, there's multiple definitions and it's, uh, it, it can be something that uh, you can go into a lot of detail about and I'll talk a bit about the, the uh, neuroanatomy and the uh, physiology of this, but really as, as a basic, it would be uh, stimulating the sacral spinal nerve roots with an electrical stimulation of some sorts. And the aim is to modulate a neural pathway. And the target organs would then be the pelvic organs, um, which makes sense from a neurological point of view, from a uh, anatomy of the nerves point of view. So um, our, our lead and our neurostimulator need to create a non-painful, low amplitude electrical pulses. So it's controlled and in this setting it's continuous stimulation uh, which is generated by a pulse generator and the lead is implanted subcutaneously um, to make contact with the sacral nerve roots. So I am not going to go into the neuroanatomy of the bladder or of micturition but I think it does help just to have one slide to remind us all of the complex multi-level uh, peripheral nervous system and central nervous system control of micturition and the lower urinary tract. And uh, I think it's important that we just at least um, uh, remember why the sacral um, uh, nerve or the S3 uh, sacral nerve roots would be important uh, in terms of our um, our uh, impact that this treatment has. I'm just going to try and see if I can get a laser pointer. Um, so uh, your sacral micturition center is based at S2 to S4, um, and this is where your parasympathetic um, nerves uh, originate uh, as peripheral nerves, uh, and the parasympathetic nerves initiate detrusor contraction. Um, so the modulation effect it is not um, unidirectional, and we'll go into detail in that. And what I mean by that is that it, it makes sense that there's not one effect that comes from this modulation in that uh, sacral neuromodulation is used for both uh, detrusor underactivity and detrusor overactivity conditions. Um, but the sacral nerve roots and the sacral um, micturition center is the focus of the treatment. And uh, it's important to remember that our higher control of micturition comes from our central system, uh, be it the Pontine Micturition Center or higher centers. And um, one will remember names such as the periaqueductal gray and various other centers in the cerebral cortex, uh, uh, which are critical for the um, minor adjustments or the uh, awareness that we as humans have related to voiding. Um, and uh, if anybody does want to go into detail on this, there are some really interesting um, functional MRI studies that one can look at related to the effects of sacral neuromodulation on higher centers. Um, and it'll be many centers, be it the thalamus, uh, the anterior cingulates, um, the hypothalamus, various centers have been studied in terms of their potential effect um, and the potential site of effect of sacral neuromodulation. So what is the postulated mechanism? And this is all postulated because uh, there is not a 100% clear understanding of the effect of sacral neuromodulation. So I think with there being more than 20 years of experience, um, the safety is not a concern. So in terms of other impacts um, on, on 
tissues or organs. I don't think we have concerns that not having a full understanding of mechanism of action leaves us in the dark entirely, but I think it is important um, for us to just remember that um, when it comes to using treatment therapies and counseling our patients. So it, it will be an impact on the entire neurological system. And there's multiple pathways that are um, ascending and descending that uh, are triggered or uh, modulated as a result of the electrical stimulation. So the sacral nerve stimulator itself is primarily believed to activate afferent pathways. So the afferent pathways are then carried to the central nervous system, specifically to the cerebral uh, centers, and it modulates these cerebral centers. So it is the awareness and alertness that the um, patient feels or the overall overriding um, um, kind of banding together of all the information that is affected. So in this image, one can see that the impact is directly to forebrain and uh, you know, in the setting of uh, overactive bladder syndrome, it would then have a inhibitory effect on um, the various you know, detrusive overactivity signals or the um, um, afferent stimulation or the overactivity that the bladder then experiences. And um, I mentioned functional MRI scans. There are also PET scans that have been done and they show changes in cerebral blood flow with both acute and chronic sacral neuromodulation. Um, and there's a suggestion that the use of sacral neuromodulation chronically induces neuroplasticity. Um, although uh, the studies that have been done in terms of uh, switching off or um, deactivating sacral neuromodulation currently show that the effect does uh, wane. So it's, it, it doesn't seem that there's um, evidence for like a permanent change that uh, occurs uh, from you know, a specific time interval at this point. So it's, it's long-term therapy. So it's important to remember that our sacral roots contain both efferent and efferent and afferent nerve fibers, and there are uh, motor fibers and sensory fibers throughout those two. Um, the stimulus will be carried via the efferent nerves from the central nervous system, whether it's the insula or the periaqueductal gray, um, and those. Uh, so, so well, it'll be carried from those to the pontine micturition center and then via the efferent nerves. So, this is not a direct um, influence on micturition. It's not solely. Uh, related to spinal reflexes, although again uh, there are some um, studies that suggest that spinal reflex modulation is again something that is uh, relevant to the um, the physiology of maturation, uh, well the the modulation that's sacral neuromodulation imparts. Um, but mostly, it is believed that it's an indirect influence through central uh, structure modulation. And uh, the reflex bladder hyperactivity is then more these uh, spinal um, uh, reflexes that are modulated. So I'll move on to discussing the procedure itself. So I think um, we as urologists um, are uh, with uh, potentially colorectal surgeons, the main utilizers of sacral neuromodulation. We are the the page, people that do the implantations and are those who um, are interested in um, in becoming uh, proficient with this treatment modality and the implantation um, can have a lot of support. So there are a lot of uh, very experienced urologists in South Africa who are performing this treatment and who report success in their patient populations. So the main uh, important concept when it comes to sacral neuromodulation and the uh, use of it in your patient is that one has to have a test phase. So the test phase is the single most important predictor of um, success. So there's various uh, 
people who've tried to identify uh, factors that one may use or um, discussions that one can have with patients that may predict success of your unit. And I'll go into a bit of detail. And certainly there are you know, conditions that are more likely to have success than others. But in the end, um, one requires a test phase. And the two options for test phase are either to have a temporary uh, peripheral nerve evaluator lead. So the international literature suggests putting two leads in, um, and I'll tell why, and those are bilaterally into the S34A mina. Um, or the alternative, rather than your uh, temporary basic evaluation or peripheral evaluation or a percutaneous uh, temporary wire, is to insert a timed lead uh, at stage one with an external stimulation device. So the device is then not implanted into the patient's body subcutaneously, um, and that allows for test phase and if there is success one then moves on to stage two and if stage one does not show sufficient response then it is easy to remove the lead only um, and there's no large device that has been implanted into your patient so this lead uh, on the left side of the image is the basic evaluation lead uh, this has only one contact plate or one contact uh, site uh, for stimulation versus your uh, permanent implantable leads which one would use with stage one which have four um, uh, electrode sites um, the uh, PNE lead is mostly used in settings where one is trying to avoid uh, high cost and large anesthetic um, utilization. So uh, the the idea is that uh, it is often uh, inserted under local anesthetic, which means that one is not needing to um, have the patient in other parts of the world pay for uh, the service of receiving it under general anesthetic um, multiple stages um, and uh, still used with fluoroscopy uh, if one chooses to although there are certainly physicians who do not use fluoroscopy for the uh, for, uh, peripheral for the um, percutaneous nerve evaluation stage um, but the, the the basic uh, premise is that it is um, done with less cost and it is done as a outpatient and um, and the patient will then have these leads removed and will have a timed permanent lead implanted if they have success with their test phase. So the disadvantages um, of going through a PNE evaluation would be that um, if one is uh, in the setting where you're trying to reduce anesthetic usage, the patient would be uh, awake under local anesthetic and they might find this more um, uh, unmanageable and there is certainly potential mild discomfort um, or the literature reports good um, uh, tolerance of the procedure in general. It's done quite extensively in the US and the UK. And then despite new uh, modifications of the lead, the lead can migrate. So this is typically just a seven day evaluation. One doesn't do it for longer than seven days because of increased risk of migration. And if the lead does migrate, then your test phase is, I suppose, compromised and you don't know whether your success is because of uh, inadequate lead placement or because of the patient just not being a responder. And when it comes to then the timed lead, um, the test period can be for longer because the patient is, um, uh, not needing to worry about migration of the lead. This has times. Um, and overall, the studies that have been done to compare the two test phases have shown that there are superior conversion rates with using the stage one timed lead and leaving that lead in and then progressing to stage two, which is implantation of your permanent pulse generator. So this image will just show again the times. So these are the um, uh, devices that hold the lead in place. 
and then one sees the four um, electrodes on the lead. So once you've finished your test phase, one then assesses success of the test phase, and I'll go into success when we discuss the literature, and you choose together with the patient, uh, shared decision making is critical for uh, uh, sacral neuromodulation use, you choose with the patient whether or not you progress to a permanent implanted uh, timed lead uh, with a uh, implanted pulse generator. So if one has done a, uh, a PNE uh, evaluation, one then needs to change to the timed lead with the four um, uh, contact points or four electrodes. And part of the success of not neuromodulation is required on, on patients in terms of placement and trying to be fairly strict in your technique, uh, both in terms of uh, sterility and reducing infection and in terms of placing the uh, electrode in the most optimum place for stimulation. So um, I, I won't go into this more because I'd like to discuss the um, studies and the literature supporting its use more, but it is classically the S34A minute that we'll use in terms of predicting anatomy of reaching the S3 sacral nerve roots. And uh, in terms of technique, it is described that one will most likely have success in terms of best uh, stimulation if you insert your lead at the most superior and medial position in that foramen. There are surface landmarks that one uses to identify the foramen with uh, the use of fluoroscopy that one can mark out. And uh, there is a classic description of how the lead should look at end placement. So on your AP, that the lead uh, slightly bows out uh, at the tip, that it then is predicted to be following the sacral nerve roots in terms of its lie, and that um, you need to have at least two of the electrodes below the level of the inferior border of your, um, of your sacrum. Um, so, but, but there certainly are many uh, variations and we know that patients have anatomical variations. So the standard one starts with, and then you assess for success um, um, of your placement uh, intraoperatively. The implantable battery. So the newer intersystem models are now being released that are all going to be MRI compatible. Uh, previously they were not. And the um, a pulse generator or battery is either a rechargeable or a non-rechargeable, depending on the patient um, age, uh, understanding of programming patient needs. Um, and we place it in a subcutaneous pocket, just anterior to the muscles of your upper buttocks. Um, one does not want to place it deeper than 2.5 centimeters below the skin, and that's just in terms of uh, the stimulation, and it needs to be horizontal to the uh, skin. Um, and you need to be cautious in terms of placement of that uh, coverage and reducing infection rates, uh, because uh, explantation due to infection is certainly one of the potential complications. So let's go into indications for therapy. So these we mentioned briefly in terms of the FDA approvals, um, but I'd like to point out that probably one of the most successful regions or the most commonly used uh, conditions is fecal incontinence, because uh, um, patients don't have a lot of other options. I mean, there are first line and second line options for fecal incontinence. So I won't go into that, but I think it's very important to remember that this is one of the key areas where it is utilized. So for us, we'll talk about the classic uh, OAB wet and OAB dry, as well as uh, your non-neurogenic uh, urinary ret retention or underactive detrusa. I'll touch on neurogenic lower urinary tract dysfunction, uh, and then um, there is no FDA approval for the use of um, uh, sacral neuromodulation for bladder pain syndrome IC or chronic pelvic pain, but I will have one slide on that. And there certainly are um, uh, papers and, and discussions on its impact on sexual function too, which we also will not go into. So... 
Uh, we all know uh, OAB syndrome, which is overactive bladder syndrome, which is the urgency frequency syndrome or urgency frequency symptoms. And this is the most studied condition when it comes to the use of sacral neuromodulation. Uh, it is very relevant that we um, uh, discuss OAB in that it is a, a highly prevalent condition that we as urologists manage extensively. Um, and there are many, many patients who are not satisfied with first uh, line and second line therapies for OAB. Um, so first line therapies will be your conservative management, whether that's lifestyle change, such as weight loss or stopping smoking or change in fluids. And then your second lines will be, well, first line includes behavioral therapies as well. Second line is classically then your pharmacological management and will uh, have a slide on why patients may be unhappy with pharmacological management. And then we rapidly progress onto your third line, which includes Botox and sacral neuromodulation. Um, and so it, I think there's a lot of potential fear about sacral neuromodulation. And I, I'd like to allay that or just talk about why I think we should really, if we have access, and if we don't, we should be advocating for trying to get it into the government systems. But it, it, this is a, pay, a treatment that is considered safe, reversible, and uh, has good efficacy um, uh, in terms of the literature. So I, I think we need to remember that patients don't need to be kept on anticholinergics for the rest of their lives. So we do know that there are inadequacies in our other treatment options, and there's lots of literature to support that patients do not adhere to the first line and second line treatment options for OAB. And many of those reasons are because of lack of efficacy. Um, and the side effects of our medications, classically our anticholinergics are very poorly tolerated. So using sacral neuromodulation is strongly recommended by our guideline uh, govern, uh, governing uh, international committees. It, as I mentioned, it is reversible, so one can remove it. I know the cost is a major factor, which I will go into, um, but in the appropriate patient, it is minimally invasible, invasive and can have significant impact. So I know I'm going to be running out of time. I'm going to just go through the OAB slides, if the team doesn't mind. Um, apologies. Um, so our European guidelines strongly recommend offering sacral neuromodulation to patients. It's important that we remember that both Botox and sacral neuromodulation are a part of third-line treatment of OAB. Um, in the initial Rosetta trial, which compared Botox and sacral neuromodulation, the efficacy was felt to be equivalent. Um, and this was at that point based on Botox 200 units. So I think the, the Rosetta trial is difficult for us to refer to in these days because the protocols are so different from what we use and the sacral neuromodulation lead technology is very different. Uh, so I think currently our, um, at least International Continent Society and the EUA say that one can't really recommend one above the other, but it's really about shared decision making when it comes to choosing uh, which one you would like to trial. And one does not have to trial Botox for these patients. One can, if you have available, move straight to sacral neuromodulation uh, from uh, medical management of OAB. So the cost is a major concern. This was a study uh, that was um, uh, published in 2020 um, in the um, US. And at three years, the health utilization costs are significantly more still for sacral neuromodulation. Um, the five-year and 10-year projected costs are much, much, much more reassuring. So if your patient is is successfully chosen and appropriately used um, uh, for sacral neuromodulation. The cost balances out with Botox in most cases when you get to the five to 10 year mark because of the need to repeat Botox multiple times. And one can see here the percentage of patients needing re-intervention 
um, is, is significantly higher at the one year and three year mark for our Botox, which we know. So I think these are the studies we use to try and um, advocate for getting these treatments for our patients in under-resourced centers or in state if we can. Mm. So how do we judge success of sacral neuromodulation? Well, because this is quality of life and, um, a, and there are some tools that we can use, such as bladder diaries, it's really important that we mostly consider patient satisfaction with the treatment, but we do use improvement in symptoms as our main uh, target uh, to analyze success. So equal to or 50% improvement of the primary symptoms is what we require to progress to a permanent implantation. And that would be primarily on bladder diary. So bladder diary or bowel diaries are critical for the assessment and workup of the patient. And then there are, of course, the quality of life questionnaires that are also vital in terms of assessing improvement with your test phase. So the initial prospective RCTs, these were back in the 2000s that were done to assess success of OAB, um, all showed statistically significant improvement in for OAB frequency, so that's the number of daily voids, um, whether that's complete improvement or very good response, that's less than seven voids per day, or whether they had a reduction and your volume per void on a bladder diary. Um, the effect is also sustainable for the patient to do have a response. Um, so in this initial study that was done, 32% um, of patients who had uh, successful implantation were able to get to normal range of voids. So I think one of the important things is that these patients don't have 100% success, and that's very, very important to um, counsel your patients about. So this is your OAB dry patients. The OAB wet patients, um, they tend to often have a better response, but that's just um, based on the studies. Um, and a 40% completely dry response is what was seen in this initial RCT, which was done again back in the late 90s, 2000s. Um, surgical revision rates are a big concern, and these revision rates are much lower in the more recent literature. And this is very, very dependent on surgeon technique on appropriate patient selection. So when you counsel your patient, the most important thing to mention is that the goal or the aim must be developed shared, that they have appropriate expectations of improvement, and that one should look to have them expect that hopefully they will have either a 50% or just more than 50% improvement in symptoms. If they have complete improvement or they become normal voiders in terms of day frequency and they're dry, then the patient will be ecstatic. But the expectation, I think, from the start should be to try and get 50% improvement and then work from there. So then this is just more recent literature. And um, I just wanted to point out that at the 12 mark point, more than 50% improvement um, was the majority of the patients, but 30% of the patients in this study had 100% improvement in their continence. So this is incontinent patients, which is the daytime frequency patients uh, who had 70% uh, of them having between 50 and 100% improvement. Um, Device-related adverse events, um, 30% of them were reported to have uh, device-related adverse events post-implantation, and that's malfunction, infection, migration, and it includes the need for explant, so um, if patients are um, having a lack of efficacy. Um, I think I, I should probably uh, stop. Uh, Sam, I don't know, you can tell me. I, I've worked through OAB, which is, I think, the most important topic that I wanted to deal with. Um, this is a, a bit of a bigger presentation than, than I um, had my time planned for. I apologize for that. But I do want to give Sia Sanga her time for her presentation. So I'm happy to share the rest of the slides with the team. 
Um, I think I'll close off by saying that um, the um, alternative options are multiple and uh, none of these are um, as studied or supported in the literature as a sacral neurostimulation. Some of these are more um, experimental. Um, many of them are not mentioned in the guidelines at all. And um, specific sets have not necessarily been uh, designed. So um, the you know, interstim system such as uh, is being used to try and um, stimulate you know, pudendal nerve. Um, but I think it's, it's something worth knowing about that in the future, we do have new technologies that are being developed for patients who don't respond to sacral nerve stimulation and are looking at alternatives. So in summary, um, I, I think we need to advocate for getting sacral neuromodulation available for our patients. Uh, this is uh, a safe uh, treatment modality and um, the complications that do occur are um, manageable in terms of removing the device um, and managing infection. Uh, chronic pain is very, 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 very rare in terms of uh, stimulation and discomfort. Once the lead is out, we don't have large amounts of patients that have long-term pain or discomfort or neuropathic problems related to the stim. Um, this patient group are um, uh, often suffering from uh, poor efficacy and, uh, and the burden of the treatment that they have to uh, try and manage with before they get to this option. Um, and it really is a minimally invasive technique uh, or procedure. This is not major surgery. So I do feel we need to really consider it and, and try and get it into our state systems. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Alison, for um, a very uh, excellent presentation and uh, comprehensive overview of the topic. Um, yeah, no, it would have been nice that you finished it off, but you're quite right in the interest of time. Um, there's a question there from Dr. Lonabo uh, Kodi uh, from Kudeha. I don't know if you can see that on the chat. I can see the question. Uh, thanks, Dr. Tolly, for the question. So I um, have not uh, got personal knowledge of uh, literature related to um, combining sacral neuromodulation with anticholinergics or beta-3 agonists. Um, I think that's something that's interesting and that's worth looking up, absolutely. Um, I unfortunately don't know. I don't have answers for your question. I think that um, in my opinion, I probably wouldn't want to have my patient go through um, you know, being on an anticholinergic, for example, and having to deal with sacral, well, not deal, the programming and the, um, the awareness that one patient needs to have in terms of having a sacral neuromodulator is, is really important. And I think um, one either needs to optimize the sacral neuromodulation or one needs to consider whether you're going to um, go to Botox. So I would probably, if my patient failed sacral neuromodulation, uh, look at um, Botox if we, one hasn't tried that rather than a combination. But that's just me. Thanks a lot, uh, Alison. Uh, there's a question from Prof. Lazarus. Uh, Alison, thank you very much uh, for a superb talk. I uh, hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, I can. Just to say that uh, we're very lucky to be uh, having urogynecology as a um, HPCSA approved uh, subspecialty for uh, urology now. And uh, it's wonderful that we're able to offer our patients a greater level of quality of care. And I think that's coming through in the knowledge that you're talking about from your talk. Just two quick questions. Um, the first is I've never really understood how sacral neuromodulation can improve both Fowler's syndrome and the overactive bladder. And I don't know if you have any insights into that. The second thing is, is there really compelling evidence? You, you quoted one uh, article that looked favorable, but is that sufficient to um, offer this to our patients? We know that these uh, implants can have uh, significant and potentially devastating complications, albeit rare, uh, but is it any better than bladder draw? 
Um, so thanks for the questions, Prof. I appreciate it. Let me go into Fowler's syndrome first, and I'll just try and briefly share these slides. So the understanding in terms of, um, sorry, in terms of uh, the use in underactivity and overactivity is that um, our patients have um, increased awareness. So because this is a central system um, effect, it's more about uh, the, 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 the the coordination of the central versus the Pontine Duration Center being adjusted. So uh, uh, the understanding, which is again still postulated, is that by altering central awareness, um, one is able to then have the patient um, uh, adjust the way that they uh, void. So. Uh, Fowler's syndrome is actually one of the most um, positively predictive uh, conditions in, in underactive. Um, you know, there are studies that have shown that um, uh, having Fowler's syndrome predicts success in safe neuromodulation. Um, but it is, uh, it is still postulated and it's, the, it's that it's central. So that's the, um, the basic explanation. Sorry, it's not maybe a very thorough one, but that's, that's where it is. So it's, it's modulating effect, whether it's positive effect, whether it's um, reducing it or increasing effect. Um, and then, Prof, in terms of your question, so there are um, quite a few meta-analyses and systematic reviews that have been done. And the evidence is level one in terms of the fact that uh, we do have randomized controlled trials. Yes, I think it's challenging for us to, um, so there are no sham studies. Um, you cannot blind the patients because you are implanting a device into them. But uh, most of the RCTs are done by delaying treatment. So you pick a patient group, you test phase them all, and then some are implanted immediately and some are implanted six months later. And they use the delayed implant as the controlled group. Um, so I think it, it, for me, if your patient expectation is that they will have 50% or more uh, improvement and they will have about a 70 to 80 percent chance of getting 50 percent or more in the OAB setting, then I think it's better than bladder. That's that's the literature in terms of our um, OAB patients. Better than bladder withdrawal. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Alison, for those answers. I was actually interested to hear what you had to say about the outcomes in, uh, you know, bladder pain syndrome or chronic pelvic pain. Yes. Bearing in mind the pathophysiology, um, what does uh, the literature suggest, Bolet? Uh, yeah, it's a, a poor. So the main problem when it comes to chronic pelvic pain or bladder pain syndrome is that the criteria for success are so um, varied. So we don't have. Uh, so the studies are very heterogeneous. So trying to do a, a meta-analysis or a combined systematic review of literature is really challenging. But your quality of your studies is either poor or they rely on different outcomes in terms of measuring success. So quality of life and pain reduction, but uh, the current AUA mm -hmm. guidelines recommend that you can consider it for fourth line and the small observational case series that have been published have a massive you know, 48 to 72% response rate. And this isn't a 100% response. That may, means those patients have maybe got 50% improvement in their pain or their urgency frequency pain that they've got. Um, and as you can see, the level of evidence is low and the grade of recommendation is low. So we lack evidence for the chronic pain patients um, and our evidence is poor for the ICBPS patients. Yeah, no, thank you so much, uh, Alison, again, for an excellent uh, presentation. Thanks yeah, again, like, as, as Prof mentioned, uh, we're quite lucky that we have you as a, as a urologist and also, in, you know, in the process of being trained uh, as a urogynecologist. And uh, obviously, you can see the um, benefits of having that. You try to explain these complex topics to some of us. I uh, really appreciate that. Thanks a lot. That's very kind. Thanks very much for the opportunity, Sam. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Siasa Ayigani, who's 